Thank you very much, Julie, and uh, it's great to see everyone here tonight. Uh, I was going to introduce Sean and Bill, but I have to tell you, Bill is, has been our hero in the Water Quality Protection Program, and I've, I've asked him to sit up here with us and take all the questions I can't answer, uh, so, and he's agreed to do that. So think, think of the hard ones. So uh, again, it's great to see so many friends here. We all know why you're here. We're all interested in, in the Florida Keys. We're interested in this beautiful environment and we're very interested in, in the water quality. I'm gonna first uh, characterize um, the, the, the area, and I wanna start off with, we all pretty well know where the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is and where, where we're located. But what a lot of people don't realize is that this is really, we're in the crossroads. We're in the crossroads of what comes up from the Caribbean as well as what's coming down from the Gulf of Mexico. Just to show you, these are all satellite tracking current meters that have all been deployed over in the uh, Atlantic. And you can see each track has made its way and there's a few consistencies. One is that there's a gyre down here around Panama in the, this area. There's also one here. But we also very well know all about the loop current now. So all of those satellite tracking current meters not only make their way past the Florida Keys and up into the Gulf, but eventually they come past us and on out into the Atlantic. We also see that kind of connectivity with the Mississippi, uh, with, in the Gulf of Mexico, where satellite trackers were deployed. You can see all the tracks zigzagging back and forth, but ultimately they all come past the, the Florida Keys, maybe through the Florida Keys or around us, and up to into the Atlantic. Uh, we know that, uh, we know this, we, NOAA has all kinds of neat tools circling the planet. And one of them produces these kinds of satellite images. And we can see right here the, the chlorophyll plume. This is reading chlorophyll coming out of the Mississippi, going down and past the Florida Keys, going back up. And we've tracked it well off of North Carolina. So you can see that we're very well connected, not only to the Caribbean, but to the Gulf of Mexico and also to North America. Over 40% of North America drains into the Gulf of Mexico and eventually comes down and through the Florida Keys. Having said that, on a more micro scale, looking at the Florida Keys itself, we, we, are, we have some really interesting circulation patterns. As the Florida current moves between us and Cuba, a series of counterclockwise gyres spin off. These are good for lots of biological, ecological purposes. But one thing is they're going by, you can see these arrows where the water is coming out of Florida Bay and the Gulf of Mexico, very often staying on the inside of the reef track, going back around and making the loop again, perhaps. What's really interesting about that is that that water, that circulation pattern is what sets up and characterizes our local waters tremendously. We all see the water going back and forth through the tidal passes every six hours, but the majority of the water flows from the Gulf towards the Atlantic and out towards the reef track. I want to, I want to also make the setting as far and characterize the, the, the Florida Keys National Wing Sanctuary, which is this blue line, 2,900 square nautical miles, but we adjoin uh, two national parks, Everglades National Park and Biscayne National Park, and we surround the Dry Tortugas National Park, overlap four wildlife refuges, six state parks, three aquatic preserves. So it's quite an area with a, a large federal state footprint. But what's so important about this area is, is the uniqueness of it and the fact that we are located downstream of a lot that's happening in South Florida. If we look at the Florida Keys, we do have all the, all the habitats that make up a coral reef ecosystem. We have the full seascape, so to speak, from the mangrove fringe shorelines, the seagrass beds, out to the outer reefs. We also have all the habitats, all the species that make up a very complex coral reef system. We have the most biologically diverse resources here in the Florida Keys than anywhere else in the Caribbean. Now I could spend a couple of days explaining why, but that's because we have the subtemperate waters of the Gulf of Mexico merging and converging with the more tropical waters of the, of the Atlantic, forming a great deal of uh, diversity. The threats to coral reefs around the world are pretty much the same, but we also see those here locally. Those in order of, of, of major impacts are climate change, land-based land source of pollution, habitat loss and destruction or degradation, and overfishing. If we take each one of those, whew, Let's, let's take climate change, and this is where we've seen some of the greatest changes. This is uh, some metadata. This is a whole series of, of monitoring programs that were, were done in the Caribbean during the 70s and 80s. And you can see, beginning in the early 70s, 77, there started, this dark line is the amount of living coral cover. And you can see over here, this circle is where 
uh, EPA started the Water Quality Protection Program monitoring here in the Florida Keys, and you can see in 97 and 98, we had a precipitous decline in corals. Now, those happen to be the only back-to-back -back major coral bleaching events that we ever, ever had here in the Florida Keys. And if you go back through time, you can see each one of these drops is associated with a massive bleaching event that we had here in the Keys. But these two created and caused a, a tremendous amount of decline. Now, I want you to remember this because I'm going to come back to this image, or not this one, but a very similar profile a little bit later. And remember where it comes down here and then starts tapering off. I could spend a lot of time on this one photograph, but just talking about coral bleaching, the impacts that we see from climate change, uh, we've seen all these different events, but also when you get the corals when they're stressed by bleaching, you, you also then have secondary impacts of coral diseases. You have the bleaching, you have the stress, and then you have the diseases come in afterwards. That's been pretty well established now. These issues, all of, all of these threats are very complex. They're very complex to sort through. They're very complex to, to understand. But we do know that they can be addressed at the local, regional, and global scales. <coughs> One of the things that we're seeing in this, and particularly here in the Florida Keys, we're seeing Monroe County, we're seeing the state of Florida, we're seeing EPA, we're seeing a lot of leadership down here to deal with water quality problems. Uh, we now have a, a zero discharge of wastewater anywhere within the boundary of the sanctuary. We have uh, pump-out facilities. If you notice here, 250,000 gallons of sewage was pumped out just in 2005 out of Boot Key Harbor. Uh, we're now, uh, we, we are seeing that 25,000 illegal, or 25,000 septic tanks, 9,000 illegal cesspits have now been almost entirely replaced. Uh, we're at about 85 to 95 percent build-out of replacing all the uh, wastewater infrastructure with advanced wastewater treated uh, sewage. We're now also starting to work on the 124 miles of de uh, degraded canals. Already we're starting to see the infrastructure take place. Deep, uh, Key West ha has really shown leadership by stepping up with advanced wastewater treated deep water injection. We're seeing um, all, the, all up and down uh, the Keys, we're seeing improvement, uh, we're seeing pipes go on the ground, we're starting to see hookup to uh, advanced wastewater uh, facilities. The Water Quality Protection Program came when the sanctuary was designated by an act of Congress in 1990. EPA was directed by Congress to work with the state and with NOAA to develop a Water Quality Protection Program. Bill led that effort and, and uh, hats off to all the work that he did to make that happen. With that came, water or came different monitoring programs. We began monitoring the water quality itself. Uh, FIU and some of our colleagues there were doing the, the uh, water quality monitoring, the seagrass monitoring, and the state of Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission have been doing the coral monitoring. I'm not going to spend much time on each one of these slides, but I do want to point out that it was important that we start looking at the water quality in the Keys to understand what was happening on a large scale. This is, a, this is what we now know of as, as the South Florida ecosystem area. Really beginning around uh, Orlando, the Kissimmee chain of lakes, Everglades, uh, Lake Okeechobee, Everglades agriculture, all of this area is the footprint for the South Florida ecosystem. In 1991-92, we started seeing the near collapse of Florida Bay. We started seeing harmful algal blooms. We started seeing all of this water spilling out uh, towards the reef track. We started seeing a lot of changes taking place in our nearshore waters. And this was a result of the way the water had all of a sudden had been managed in recent decades. It used to be like a, a large, broad plain of slow-moving water, and you could hear a lot about this, to a system that has now been com um, compartmentalized and, and structured to the point that the water is being managed very carefully. You're going to hear a lot about that from the experts, and I'm going to defer to them on, on that. But just believe me, it did change the way the water reached our area. We know that as the water uh, comes down South Florida, it comes out to the southwest area, makes its way down and through the Florida Keys. Just to give you a, a, an, an idea of how much water comes out, I'm just going to point out Seven Mile Bridge area. There's over 370 um, metric m m meters of water coming through there per second. And you can see the other passes. So there's a lot of water that come, is coming out of the Florida Bay area at any one time. Our water quality protection program, the monitoring program, originally started out with over 150 stations. 
that were monitored on a quarterly basis. The idea of that the idea of that water quality monitoring program was to establish a baseline, document events, both chronic and episodic, uh, assess trends or changes in water quality over time. I'm not going to read all these to you, but really to uh, try to document uh, the compliance practices and to see what was working and, and what's not working over time. We have been able, beginning as early as 1995, to start getting trends as to what's going on. And you, you can look at nitrogen. You can see the pockets, the bluer the color, the greater the, the level of nutrients. You can see phosphorus. You can see this more purple area. Is, is, there's more phosphorus over here in these areas. But what you won't see are these nutrients getting out here towards the reef track. Salinity, you can see the fresh water is coming out of the Everglades, out of the, out of the coastal areas. Over here, chlorophyll A, which pretty much uh, tracks what's happening with your phosphorus. You can see the green, it's more chlorophyll. Same thing in, in 2000, that was 99, this is 2000. Uh, inorganic nitrogen, you can see pockets of it over in the bay. Salinity is here. You can see phosphorus along the coastline. Again, in, in 2000, you can see how the chlorophyll A somewhat tracked the phosphorus. Again, these, these stations are not showing those nutrients offshore. Now, what I'm going to show you a little bit in a little bit here are the spatial and temporal trends. The initial waters of the Keys are elevated in, in dissolved inorganic nitrogen and uh, total organic carbon relative to the Tortugas. And, and really, it, it, it indicates it's a, a terrestrial source. The upper Keys have slightly better water quality. We're seeing increasing trends in total phosphorus driven by the Florida Shelf. We're seeing decreasing trends in total organic carbon driven by the Everglades, and we're also seeing decreasing trends in dissolved oxygen. We're not sure what's causing that. On a regional scale, the uh, Florida shelf currents are being elevated. Uh, they're, they're bringing, if you go along the southwest coast, they're bringing elevated total phosphorus to the sanctuary. Upwellings of nutrients of deep water off the reef are bringing nutrients up onto the reef naturally. And the gyres are bringing in low nutrient waters that's mixing with all that that's going on. What about Everglades restoration? What's that going to do? We're going to see small increases in freshwater input to eastern Florida Bay, but with, within normal ranges of interannual variability. We're also going to see large increases in freshwater output from Shark River Slough. We can expect that. We may see more uh, low salinity water traversing the Keys Passes, and we may see nutrient inputs in, into the bay and shelf, they will, will increase, but not proportionally more so than, uh, than the amount of, or de, they're going to be decreased according to the concentration and the, and the load that's going on. The outflow of Florida Bay water through Hawk Channel, now this is really important because one of the things that, that we keep hearing coming from various sources of information is that nutrients are getting out to the reef and the nutrients are what's killing the corals. That is absolutely not the case. And this, and I'm, I'm pay close attention to what we're going to be presenting here, what I'll show you, show you. Input of Florida Bay nutrients to the Keys coral reefs is minimal compared to <laughs> offshore tidal boards and upwellings. The Water Quality Protection Program now looks like this that, uh, as a result of decreased funding and so on. We've had to cut back on the numbers of stations, but we're still getting more than enough information to understand what's happening with the trends. What we know now in this 2011 uh, report Several major important, uh, important points came out, but the first is the documentation of elevated nitrate in the near shore, inshore waters of the Florida Keys. This has been the same since 1995. They found out that the, there's a halo of high nutrients around the Keys themselves, but that does not make its way out to the outer reef track. The result was evident from the first sampling. The gradient was not observed in comparison to transects in the Tortugas area. In other, in other words, it's pointing to human impacts in the nearshore waters around the Keys. And this type of di dis distribution implies an inshore source which is diluted by low nutrient Atlantic waters. Now, if you look at this bar graph, I'm not going to show you many bar graphs, uh, but this one, are the, this is the inshore waters. You can see the, the nitrogen is elevated. As you move to Hawk Channel, it's down a little bit. As you get to the offshore reef, it goes down a little more. As you get to the uh, inshore Tortugas, it's, it's almost like what it is in our offshore reef area, and the offshore tor Tortugas is not much different. So you can see that the nitrogen is nearshore in the inshore waters, not offshore. Uh, some other trends. Um, I'm going to be bringing this in for a landing here shortly. Uh, 
you can see the other spatial and temporal trends in nutrients. And if you look at, uh, this is all salinity. The bluer the color, the fresher the water. You can see there's higher salinities in the near shore waters in some areas. But I want to draw your attention to this one. This is nitrate. This is taking the, the, all the sampling from 95 to 2011 and averaging it. And this is, you can see, here's the halo of nitrates that I was talking about around the islands. And you can see right here, like this real red area, that's because right there the phosphorus has been used up by all the seagrasses in that area so much that you have nitrogen that's, that's being uh, measured and, and recorded in that area. Phosphorus, you can see again, uh, it's, it's all along the southwest shelf. And, and again, none of these are making their way out to the reef. Uh, chlorophyll, again, somewhat tracks the, the phosphorus. It's clear that the trends observed inside the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary are influenced by regional conditions outside the sanctuary boundaries. I mentioned seagrasses. I'm going to do this because For Jim Forkman from FIU could talk two weeks about seagrasses. And he calls this the, the seagrass sanctuary, not the coral reef sanctuary. And I just want to say that seagrasses are extremely important to this area. I can't spend much more time on it, but I want to go to this last slide. And this is the one I said I would come back to. Now, if nutrients were what was killing the reef all along, just nutrients, you would not see these. Now, these are different, different uh, taxa. Macroalgae, you've seen there's been some variation. Octocorals, the soft corals, you've seen they've gone up, and we're seeing that clearly. But this, these yellow diamonds are the coral reefs. And there in 96, 97, 98, you can see that same precipitous decline. They have remained somewhat level ever since. They were starting to go up, and then in 2010, we had the cold snap that knocked our corals back again down to here. Now they're coming back up, and I hear that the 2013 data is going to put it up just a little bit more again. Point being, if it were, not, if it were nutrients, those nutrients have been here or supposedly have been here, yet the corals have not responded that way. Thank you.